Well, years ago, I uh, used to play a lot of tennis, and I really enjoyed the game, and uh, I was never terribly accomplished, but uh, I did enjoy it, and I played halfway decent. But I used to get really, really frustrated because when I played, I wanted to serve as well as Boris Becker. Now, that tells you how old I am, by the way. And I wanted to return serve like John McEnroe, or not return serve, I wanted to return serve like uh, Jimmy Connors and play the net like John McEnroe. And I would get frustrated when I couldn't do these things until I realized none of those guys can do all that either. McEnroe can't serve like Becker and Becker can't return serve like Connors. So I was getting frustrated by comparing myself to these guys and realizing finally that I'm going to fall short and just play the best I can play and enjoy the game. But you know, we do this a lot. We compare ourselves to one another. We compare our jobs and our cars and our kids and grandkids and our houses and fashion is all built around comparing oneself to another, right? Some people get involved in comparing themselves based on their IQ. And then they found out not too many years ago that something even more important than IQ is EQ, which means emotional quotient or emotional maturity. It's this whole thing of trying to keep up with the Joneses, except for in a more insidious way. And you know what? It always leaves us in a bad place because there's always going to be somebody who is better than us or somebody that's not as good, and so we end up with either a lower opinion of ourselves than we deserve or we think we're better than others. And i got to tell you, it's poison to our self-worth and who God created us to be. We see this whole dangerous game being played out in our gospel lesson. In today's gospel, we have two men that we learn about that they, Jesus tells a parable that they go up to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, and the other, we find out, is a tax collector. Remember this Pharisee's words? God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I don't rob or scam or even cheat on my wife. I'm not even like that man over there. Unlike him, I fast and tithe, and I'm sure he doesn't. So really, I thank you, God, that you've made me so faithful. Wow. This passage really convicts, doesn't it? If we're not found guilty in listening to this parable, then we're probably deluding ourselves. We pray this prayer probably too often with too much justification and relief. It all starts out as a benign statement, doesn't it? A brief observation of comparison, a glance that sizes another person up, an aspect of an individual singled out as especially distasteful. Oh, she's fat, or he's poor, or they're so old. These are all examples of our human brokenness, our sin. Of course, the sin is not obesity or poverty or aging, it is our value judgments of others' perceived shortcomings that convict us. And rarely do we leave it there. We begin to judge and often we begin to assign moral failures on their part as reasons to justify our negative judgments. We, want, we think if, well, she would just diet or he would just get a better job. This too leads us down a dangerous path as we begin to judge people without understanding them. That we judge them without any empathy. And rarely do we even try to see another as Jesus sees them. And so like the Pharisee, we stand apart and aloof. Jesus, on the other hand, draws near to the very people that we look down upon. 
This story calls out this sin of ours, this sin of dismissal, the sin of one-upmanship. It calls to attention that time and that space in between the all-too-quick valuation and the final verdict of whether or not we deem someone as a person who deserves our attention or our love. You know, our society excels in deciding another's fate, and especially their value based on superficial things. It is true. Our society also validates our judgments, and it's true that the rich, the young, or is it true, I should ask actually, is it true that the young, the rich, the beautiful, are more valued than their counterparts. Luke sees it very differently. Throughout his gospel, Luke points out that God's reversal, where the sick, the poor, and the suffering, and the outcast are not thrown out further, but welcomed. Our Pharisaic friend in this passage either forgot or never knew this truth. He's far too certain of his value to God and that his future is secure because of his own righteousness. And since he's so righteous, this tax collector must not be worth much to him or to God. His sense of justification gets caught up in his own self-righteousness rather than trust in God's love. So, does this gospel have any good news, or is it about all about judgment? Certainly, we're not going to find any in the behavior of the Pharisee. So where do we look for, for grace? Could it be where the tax collector bows his head and recognizes he has no righteousness to, of his own to lift up before God? Perhaps the good news is also found in the absolution felt after confessing the words of Jeremiah. We acknowledge, Jeremiah writes, our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Can the idols of the nations bring rain or the heavens give showers? Is it not you, O Lord, our God, we set our hope on you, for it is all you who do all of these things. Knowing that the Pharisees are regularly cast in the Gospels as Jesus' opposition, it's pretty easy for us to judge this Pharisee as self-righteous and a hypocrite and assume, then, that the moral of this story is for us to be humble. And there's good reason for thinking that. After all, Jesus says, be humble. So is this lesson, so is this the lesson we should take home with us? The only problem is with this conclusion is that it too becomes law and not life. We could walk out of here thinking to ourselves, Lord, we thank you that we're not like other people, hypocrites and overly pious, self-righteous, or even like the Pharisees. After all, we come to church each week and listen attentively to the scripture, and we have learned that we should always be humble. But here's the essential contrast. The Pharisee makes a claim to righteousness based on his own accomplishments, that his prayer life, his worship, his fasting, his giving is so much better while the tax collector relies entirely on God's benevolence, the grace of our Lord. Rather than be grateful for his blessings, the Pharisee appears smug to the point of despising others. In his mind, there are two kinds of people, the righteous and the immoral, and he's grateful that he has placed himself among the righteous. The tax collector, on the other hand, isn't so much humble as desperate. 
It's not that he's humble, but he's desperate. He is too overwhelmed by his plight to take time to divide humanity into sides. All he recognizes is, is that he stands, as he stands near the temple, is his great need. There, he therefore stakes his hopes and his claims not on anything he's done or deserved, but entirely on the mercy of God. The same is true for us. Each time we try to rely on our gifts and talents, each time we think it's enough to justify ourselves before God, we find ourselves yet again with nothing to claim but our dependence on God's mercy. The fact of the matter is we too are justified by the grace of Jesus and we are invited to return to our homes in mercy, grace, and gratitude. No hoops to jump through. Just trust in God. As we sing in one of our favorite hymns, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, the refrain reminds us, On Christ the solid rock I stand. It's Christ that solid rock in which we stand. All other ground is indeed sinking sand. Self-righteousness, even humility, is nothing more than sinking sand. Only the mercy and the love of God is solid rock.